A-34 Comet. Built in 1944. Fast, well-armed, and deadly. Britain's best tank of World War II. Once a symbol of victory, today it's all but forgotten. This comet has been hit with high explosives and left to die. But now, a team of tank collectors are working to bring it back to life. On an island in the south of England, the Isle of Wight Military History Museum is one of the few private workshops where you can go to get your tank fixed. And when it comes to restoring World War II tanks, these guys are among the best in the business. Dave Arnold is the man with the vision. I am the managing director of the Isle of Wight Military History Museum. Dave Barnes is his 21-year-old nephew. We do sort of a number of things, really. We do a lot of welding, and we take tanks apart, and we put them back together. Bob Darwood is a military historian and vehicle electrics expert. You dragged me into this, really. <laughs> it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> they started out restoring tanks for other people. Since then, they have built up an impressive collection of their own, including 36 tanks. Back in 92, I'd already reached the point of owning the Centaur, the Sexton, and I had the three Comets. And at that point, I realized that I'm either going to have to do something that's going to make a business out of it or sell up, because there's no way I could afford to keep all those tanks. <laughs> that's when Bob and I sat down one day and said, do you reckon we could do it on our own? And we just tried to do it on our own. Their next job has been on Dave's back burner for 12 years. It's a rare 1944 Comet. Weighing 34 tons, the Comet was faster than the American Sherman. It had thicker armor, wider tracks, and a bigger gun. When they were first issued, the Comets were actually given to the crews that came out of Sherman's. And the first time they drove them, they reported back and said that it was like driving a cross-country sports car. They were that good cross-country. Various historians look at the Comet as probably the best British tank to see service in the Second World War. This Comet has been rescued from an army target range. It's been shot at, set on fire, and vandalized. The damage is extensive, but because this tank is so rare, Dave and his crew think it's worth trying to save. At the moment, there are probably 12 comets that I know of that are in restorable or are in running condition. Um, there are probably no more that will be restored. from three destroyed comets to make one good one. They're going to cut out the front end of one and replace it with another. They begin by stripping the interior. Big one, eh? Chisel. With these projects, I do a lot of the stripping out. Um, I do a lot of the spraying, I do a lot of the sandblasting as well, so I do quite a hefty old bulk of it. Every time we take an old tank apart, they're always full of people's throwaways. We find wallets, always find pop cans, crisp packets, 
Mm. Unusual stuff. Now, what about the things you find in a tank, then? How about a kiddie shoe? <laughs> Maybe the crew had small feet. <laughs> Sometimes they find original parts in perfect condition. Yeah, if you want to break that, that's like, that's treasure. That is. Absolute treasure. People have always got in them and vandalised them. And yeah, uh, one of the things they vandalise is the dial indicator for the turret, because it's a nice instrument-looking thing. The first thing the kids do is get a brick and smash it. And this one was intact, so that's really good. Excellent. With the turret stripped out, it's time to remove the gun. For us to get cracking on this tank and we're going to get it apart, the first thing we're going to do is unscrew the gun barrel. Here you go, yeah. Yeah. Have a quick look. He's just seeing how far the barrels come out of the breach. That's about the eight. Breach ring, that is. That's about eight, David. Now you've got the weight of the gun, it's sliding back into the turret. That's all right. They're pondering what to do. We're going to. Get like a strop, put it round the arm, the boomer, and that, put it through the end of that so we can sort of pull. And as we pull, it will support it slightly as well, so it won't just drop. When the comet was ordered, the British Army wanted tank mounting the 17-pounder gun. A 17-pounder was the only British tank gun that could take on all of the different German armor. Before the Comet, British tanks were no match for German Panthers and Tigers. German guns were more powerful and accurate, and their armor could withstand a direct hit from any gun mounted on a British tank. The British needed a better tank with a bigger gun. What had happened was, back in 1942-43, we designed a tank called Cromwell, for which a high-velocity 75mm gun was intended. By some mess or another, they find out when Cromwell is built that it will not accept this gun. The solution was to build a new tank with a larger turret to handle the bigger gun. The heavy 17-pounder field gun was modified into a 77mm tank gun. This new tank would become known as the A-34 Comet. The Comet 77mm gun fires exactly the same round as the 17-pounder. The only difference is that the barrel tube itself is shorter. You could, in a sense, call it a sawn-off 17-pounder. The 77mm would soon prove to be the best Allied tank gun of the war. I would expect the Comet crew to think they got the best tank in the world in every respect. Heavier much better armoured, and just that bit bigger, so it could carry a better turret, larger gun. Lovely. Oh, that lovely view. Oh, I've never took one out before. It was absolutely dead easy, wasn't it? That's as good as the day that was made in 1944. It's heavy. With the gun barrel removed, they go inside to take out the breech ring. The breech ring is immensely heavy, and the only way you can get it out is through the loader's hatch. The loader's hatch is actually specifically designed that the breech ring will just fit through it. I'll it. That's 350 pounds or something, isn't it? Take a bow now, then. <laughs> What are we doing then? Go down and start turning well, the gun? Why don't we take this off earlier on? Because you can see everything in there now, look. There you go. The breech ring was the heart of the Comet's new 77mm gun. It was designed to fire a new type of ammunition that could penetrate heavy armour. Towards the middle, I think, of 1944, the Britain had produced a thing called the armour-piercing discarding sabot round. New in 1944, the discarding Sabo armor piercing round is still used today to destroy enemy tanks. 
David is for armor piercing. Makes just a hole in uh, the armor. And if you hit ammunition, the tank probably explodes. Instead of using an explosive charge, the Sabo round fires a solid dart. You end up with this incredibly dense dart of tungsten or depleted uranium, which the impact is just frightful and the, the result horrible. The dart travels at extremely high velocity and uses kinetic energy to smash through the armor of an enemy tank. Today's German Leopard 2A6 is armed with the most powerful tank gun in the world. And when it fires a Sabo round, it can destroy an enemy tank four kilometers away. It's uh, basically the same cannon as in the M1 Abrams. The only difference is this gun is longer and so you have a higher pressure and a higher speed of, of the ammunition. For the uh, Sabre, it's uh, 1,650 meters per second. The higher velocity means greater accuracy and more power to penetrate armor. But I think uh, basically the, the tactic has not changed in so many ways since uh, the Second World War. The Comet's innovative gun firing the new Sabo round was the most accurate British tank gun of the war. When they designed the Comet gun, it was known that some of the tank crews at 1,000 yards, that's 3,000 feet, could actually land three shells in one square foot. So by the end of the war, the crews were really, really good. And they had good reason to be. After nine months' development, the British finally had a tank that could take on heavy German armor. The only question, could they deliver enough of them in time to make a difference? For Dave's crew, the first phase of the teardown is complete. It must weigh, must be about 400 weight. So that's 500 pound. That's all you can do on that floor. Got it. With the dog's bollocks, we've never done that before, and we're marvellous at it. It went like a dream. Yeah. None of us got hurt. I've still got all my fingers and thumbs. Yeah, I've still got more. I've got yeah, my gloves, fantastic. I sure. Phase two. Get that big chunk out. Yeah. Phase two starts with the mantlet. It has to come out before the turret can be removed. In order to get the turret off, we have to get the mantlet off, and that's probably going to be easier said than done. Oh. Flat on the back of there. <laughs> don't you break that. Don't you that break hurts. it. Yeah. Don't you break it. You naughty boy. The crew at the Isle of Wight Military History Museum has made good time taking apart their Comet tank. They have stripped the interior and removed the gun and breech ring. Now it's time to remove the six and a half ton turret. This calls for some heavy equipment. A tank fitted with a crane. It's called an ARV, an armored recovery vehicle. When we uh, need a bit of lifting up, we break out the ARV and uh, give things a bit of a pull around with it. Easy peasy. There's more trouble getting it out of the shed than it is using it. Before the turret will come off, the mantlet has to go. We have to take the mantlet off because there are six or eight bolts underneath the mantlet that hold the turret to the turret ring. We've got fairly good lifting equipment. We try to use lifting equipment rather than break our backs, but every now and again, brute force and ignorance is the only way to get some bits out. We let, let the young ones do that. The bolts are seized with rust, but Dave has a brand new impact wrench to jar them loose. I'm just about to undo a try, and the four bolts that hold the mantlet. So we can get the mantlet off. Yeah. Good luck. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. 
piss that out. <laughs> it was harder putting the tool on than it was taking that out. Jesus, this gun's on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've got, we got a tilt to mantle it now so we can get to the two bottom bolts. And then that's when they're all rusty. The bolts come out, but the mantlet doesn't move. <laughs> don't you break that. Don't you break it. Yeah. Don't you break it. You naughty boy. OK, so what can you do then? I think you need a Bible. Yeah, a Bible, man. Yeah, look at the Bible. When all else fails, Dave consults the original service manuals. Lift out the bearing caps that have rusted in for 60 years, trunnion bearing ring, and withdraw the mantlet and cradle, approximately two foot. And that means... <laughs> As Dave consults the manuals, Bob records the data plates, serial numbers, and markings. One of the interesting things we'd like to try and do at the museum is um, get the individual serial numbers of the vehicles and try and trace back their histories of unit, etc. Um, this is fairly hard to do in the case of British vehicles, certainly during the Second World War, because um, records are fairly sparse. According to the data, this comet was built in November 1944. A month later, it was sent to the men at the front. The original order for the comet was for 1,700 vehicles. Um, that's what the statistics actually say were built, but we're fairly dubious that it never, ever reached that sort of quantity. But there is no actual fixed figures for how many were made. The comet's probably the the tank the, the British Army wanted in early 1944, but it got it in late 1944. December 15th, 1944. The men of the 11th Armored Division were issued their new comets. But the next morning, the German Army launched a surprise attack. The Battle of the Bulge had begun. The comets are ready for action, but the men have not yet trained how to use them. The first units were going to equip with it in late 1944, but they had to abandon the changeover process because the Battle of the Bulge kicked off. After consulting the service manuals, Dave has instructions to remove the mantlet. Yeah, all figured out, yeah. Consulted the words, the knowledgeable words. Undo the trunnion caps, remove them, which is going to take a bit of time. But the manuals don't help. Okay. Oh, Dave, Dave, hang on, hang on. Well, this stuff's stuck, look at it. She's out over there. That feet all pathetic. There's not much. All soft on it. Yeah, it won't swim on Dave. That ain't going nowhere. It's an absolutely really stupid thing to put turret bolts underneath the gun mantlet. Yeah. It makes it unserviceable in the field. Yeah. Modern tank designers have learned that it's important to listen to your mechanics. Today's main battle tanks are engineered for rapid field repair. Each component is designed to be replaced as quickly as possible. Jobs that used to take days are now accomplished in minutes. The faster the repair, the sooner the tank is ready for action. It's a special kind of job where you have to learn to work in a crew uh, as a team. So all parts have to work together. And to keep this machine running and uh, work together as a crew with, uh, with the other guys on the tank, I think it's, uh, it needs a, a lot of training. The crew refused to give up on the mantlet. Solid. We 
leave. Undone the trunnion bolts. We've jacked, we've pushed, we've pulled. We've swarmed, we've hit. We've had dinner. Edge, no. Uh, you're you're all right. I'm absolutely fine. Jack just collapsed inside. <laughs> just missed his leg. I've had enough of this. I'm bored. It's a real job. Oh, he, he gets very stressed out at times and that. Uh, if two people are stressed out and you're working together like that, you've got to just walk away from it, have a chill, come back to it uh, straight ahead, basically. But if the work's important and it's got to be done and that, we all have to knuckle down and get on with it. Perseverance pays off, and the mantlet finally breaks free. I've never been held back by thinking I can't do it. Just say that you can do it and get on with it. I'm off, I think. I just lift off. January 25th, 1945. After 40 days of intense fighting, the German offensive had collapsed. The Battle of the Bulge was over. The men of the 11th Armored Division resumed training in their new comets. The tank's speed, thicker armor, and bigger gun were appreciated by the men. And soon, they were ready for the final push into Germany. With the mantlet gone, the crew is ready to remove the turret. is, uh, I think, about six and a half tons. We've taken out the gun, the mantle, the breech ring, all the extra bits. There's probably about four tons left. Now we've got the turret off, let's just shove the thing back indoors, cos I've had a gut fall and I'm shagged out. Maybe for scrap, then. The crew takes a needed break, because the toughest part of the teardown is about to begin. part of the Comet teardown is about to begin. With the turret gone, Dave's crew can now lift the engine deck and pull out the engine and gearbox. Bob and Ginge are going to tackle the engine. Ginge is a retired British tank driver. Bob is a vehicle electrics expert. They both know how to fix a tank engine. Bob and Ginge are going to have a real job to get the gearbox and engine out. It's all been underwater, and all the bolts have completely rusted away and lost their heads. Yeah, the I wouldn't want to do it. That's why I'm sending them in there to do it. The Comet was powered by a 600-horsepower Meteor engine, one of the most powerful tank engines of its day. Hang on. Dave said stop for some reason. Well, clear. As long as there's no cracks in the blocks and stuff like that, we'd probably reuse that. Try and take it apart, get all the pistons through. But after 60 years of neglect, this engine is a wreck. The water had collected in the back of the tank, so the gearbox is actually underwater. So again, all that you can see the state it's in. Once I've managed to get them out, it just involves a lot of hitting it with a sledgehammer. As you may notice, we hit a lot of things with sledgehammers. <laughs> the Meteor engine was built by Rolls-Royce in 1944. The Meteor engine is a V12, 60-degree inclined, 27-litre um, petrol engine. Uh, 600 horsepower is its output. It's a modified version of the engine that powered the Spitfire. On a tank, the lighter the engine, the more weight can be added to the armor. In 1944, the lightest, most powerful engines around were the gasoline power plants built for fighter planes. And they will go cross-country so fast you can get them airborne. 
fact, there's a picture in the manual that's got a small picture of one jumping over a bank, and it says, this should be avoided. <laughs> MTU Friedrichshaven makes the lightest, most powerful tank engines in the world. Instead of using a gasoline-powered aircraft engine, these engineers have developed a high-tech, lightweight diesel. Uh, the diesel technology made such big progress that nowadays, modern diesel engines like uh, our products are as compact as comparable aircraft engines have been uh, 30, 40 years ago. One advantage of a diesel engine is that it can produce greater torque at lower speed. Because only with high torques, especially at low speeds, you are able to accelerate the tank as fast as the end user wants to do it. At 63 tons, the modern Leopard 2A6 weighs twice as much as a Comet, but it can move twice as fast. With 1,500 horsepower, it has enough torque to accelerate to 70 kilometers per hour. It has the highest power-to-weight ratio of any tank engine in the world. Without the resources of a German engine factory, it's going to take Bob and Ginge a long time to fix this engine. Now, the final phase of the teardown can begin. First, the wheels come off. Then the side armor is removed to access the suspension. When we restore the vehicle, unlike some people that would just sandblast and paint the outside of the vehicle, we do it properly. So we take all the side armor off to get to the suspension. And then once we get the side armor off, we're going to actually restore all the suspension and check it all out properly. To get the side armor off, you have to take all of the side armor bolts out. The side armor is in five big slabs of side armor. It's an inch and an eighth thick. So what we've just done is we've just taken out all the bolts we can get out easily. The next phase is to take out all the countersunk screws that are really difficult to get out. We're heating up the armor plate around the bolt and partially heating up the head of the bolt to expand it to break the rust between the two. It's normally a hell of a job. The bolts are really, really difficult to get out, and each of the side armors weighs about half a ton. We always try and unscrew them to try and save them, because that would be very expensive to have new ones made. Each plate of armor weighs half a ton. Safety pins are inserted at the top to hold it in place. OK, uh, wedgie wedgie. Wedgie wedgie. Wedgie wedgie. Which one, this wedgie or the I long wedgie? I think that's a lovely looking wedgie wedgie. OK. Wakey wakey! I need my faith trusty assistant, Tonto. Oh, Tonto! I've beat the living out of this one, and that one's fell off. In fact, from now on in, you're in charge. Oh, bloody hell. I am now the apprentice. Yeah? You're my bitch. <laughs> I'm your bitch. Hidden treasure. Oh, in there. <gasps> That's the best we've ever seen one that we've taken apart yet. Normally, they're just complete red rust. I mean, that has still got most of its paint on it still. And that there, that's a suspension spring case, and so is that. That is the damper tube. That's a Comet one. That thin one is actually a Centaur tank one. The suspension a offers one. a moment of discovery. This comet has been repaired sometime during the war. Now we've got all the uh, suspension out, the next job is to sandblast it all, and that's a real horrible, dirty job, and we're going to send young Dave in to do that. As the comet is sandblasted and primed, the new front armor is prepped to go on. Hopefully, once it's blasted and primed, it'll look as good as the day it left the factory. Maybe even better. March 29th, 1945. The 11th Armored Division mobilized on the west bank of the Rhine River. 832 men with 208 Comet tanks. 
the invasion of Germany was about to begin. For the comet, it would be a baptism of fire. The teardown is finally complete. Now it's time to start putting this tank back together. That's not good, Dave. That's not good. That is not good. the Isle of Wight Military History Museum have completed the major teardown of their comet tank. It's time to start putting it back together again. They begin with the front armor. What we're trying to do is we're trying to put the front of a, a scrap tank that we've cut this chunk out of into the one that we obviously want to keep. Problems you encounter is that all these tanks were handmade. Even though they were made in jigs, there was probably a lot of tolerances. So the part we're trying to fit doesn't necessarily want to fit in the thing we're trying to fit it into. You know there's angles inside? Yeah. They're on there, because they don't fit into each other. Look. Uh, as far as I know, no one has actually ever tried to repair the front of a comet with using the parts cut out of a, a donor vehicle. I think this is the first time it's been done. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I think it's the way to go. It's recycling. See, we haven't just restored this, we've used authentic parts. You could have made the front out of new metal plate, but when it was in there, it wouldn't look as good. Because this has got all the, you know, the, the marks on it and the aging on it to match the rest of it. What are you gonna catch that chain yet? Dave takes his restoration work seriously, because in the world of tank collecting, it's all about the details. Just spot on where it is. Each year at the Bovington Tank Museum, southwest of London, tank collectors gather to show their stuff. Yeah, we thought we'd come down and show our faces. Yeah. And just remind a few people that we still exist. Mm. If you are in a hidey way on that. In a hidey hole on the Isle of Wight. This year features the only running tiger tank in the world. I'm, I'm going to wet my pants when I see the tiger. I can't wait. <laughs> Don't forget, we won the war. They all forget it, Randy. We're going to bring the next event oh, forward. Thank the Germans you. didn't win. Besides getting these machines to run, incredible attention is paid to the details that make each vehicle authentic. It takes time, dedication, and lots of money. For those on a budget, there are smaller options. But for Dave and his crew, the answer was to build their own museum. Because we had no money, the whole place was built on a very, very limited budget. Built the whole thing. Me, Bob, and David, when he came from school, built a whole lot. To get where we are now, it's taken us 12 years. And no money. <laughs> and this year, they're planning to launch their first annual tank show. We're going to have a show that's just on our own site. And we're going to have, uh, probably this year, be 10 running tanks out on the rough ground behind me. And there's going to be uh, partying at night time, bars, food, good atmosphere. But before the party, that front armor has to go in. It's time for the MIG welder. MIG welding, that's metal inert gas. The metal is the feed wire that comes out the middle. That can be anything. That could be aluminium, stainless steel, mild steel, whatever you want to put through it. The armor plate is homogenized rolled armor. If you weld this plate with mild steel wire, the welds will crack as soon as they cool down. So we have to weld this with stainless steel, just like it was originally welded. And this is expensive stuff. It's 120 pounds sterling a roll, compared to the mild steel wire's 13 pounds sterling a roll.
They don't like welding through rust and they don't like welding through paint. So it's going to qu quickly get in there and just clean around the primer that we've already put on just to get a good weld around there. Really, we're not really into tank respiration. What we're really into is dressing up in all this protective equipment. That's what we like doing. It's a fetish. In order to fit the front armor, Dave has to make adjustment brackets. The two-inch rolled steel plate weighs almost three tons. Oh, it's Very going to take tight. a few tries before it goes in. It's already gone out of hand. No, we there's plenty started, of people yeah. that have got a lot more money than we have that can obviously afford to chuck huge amounts of money at this. So you're never actually going to compete with them. But they don't do it themselves, do they? If I actually had the money to pay someone else to do this, I wouldn't bother doing it. It's just, what's the point? It's not a hobby, though, is it? It's no fun at all. I can stand back and I can look at this when it's done and think, yeah, I did that. A hobby is something you do yourself and then you enjoy it yourself afterwards. Hmm. That's a hobby. Yeah, this isn't a hobby, though, but getting paid to do this. Yeah, it's partly a hobby, though. It's a way of life. Right. While Dave and Dave work on the front end, Bob concentrates on the details. Bob is a really good guy, but when he disappears down his shed, no one really knows what goes on down there. Wiring tanks is what he does for fun. And the Comet Cruise Tank, that's a 12-volt DC system, basically similar automatically to most heavy vehicles of the period. Lately, Bob has been restoring the instrument panels. Just satisfying to take a, a smashed-up instrument panel and rebuild it back to sort of working order. The work is painstaking and requires patience. My favourite thing about working on tanks is, is the connection to the military history and the, the fellas who manned them. It gives you a real tactile connection to the things you read about. And you get a much better idea of what the technical backup that would be required to keep an armoured formation in the field, etc. And it gives you um, a big respect for the men who manned them. March 1945, Allied forces crossed the Rhine and the invasion of Germany had begun. The situation changes dramatically once the Rhine has been crossed. All join in this same mad race to get into Germany as fast as possible, probably to head off the Russians coming the other way and to head for our respective areas. For the invasion to succeed, the Allies had to move fast. It was a new type of war, with emphasis on speed and endurance. What this meant for the Comet as a, almost a, a sort of first attempt at battle, was long road drives, probably at high speed, very fast and furious actions. And going up against Tigers for the first time, I think with the success that the regiments enjoyed there, you get a tremendous boost. The Comet, with its fast, reliable engine and hard-hitting gun, proved to be the right tank at the right time. But tank commanders would soon learn that the Germans were not going to give up without a fight. Young men armed with Panzerfausts were waiting to ambush any tank that came along. The single high-explosive round could blast through the tank's armor at short range. By themselves, tanks were extremely vulnerable. Luckily, the Comet could carry back up. Towards the end of the breakout, as the British troops were going through Holland, Belgium, and into Germany, the, the advance was so fast that the troops grabbed lifts with whatever they could going by. And you see a lot of pictures of the Comets with like several, you know, 10, 12 troops all hanging off the back of them, just trying to get a lift to save walking. I think that was probably one of its most valuable roles. By carrying troops, Comet commanders were able to prevent ambush. If you've got infantry actually on your vehicle and you run into the sort of situation we talked about where you've got lighter handheld anti-tank weapons, if these guys can dismount and start moving forward, 
you pity the chap with the Panzerfaust, because he's then got problems. So it was mutually very beneficial. What soldiers and tankers improvised in combat has since become a standard tactic of modern warfare. Today, the integration of infantry and tank is known as combined arms operations. Fort Bliss, Texas. The 4th Brigade of the 1st Armored Cavalry specializes in combined arms operations. Here, the M1 Abrams trains for combat with the M2 Bradley armored fighting vehicle. The main gun in the Bradley is a 25 millimeter Bushmaster chain gun. It's the best gun in the world. The Bradley carries a squad of six to eight soldiers, specially trained for counterinsurgency operations. Traditionally, the tank in, in a force-on-force in a force, uh, Cold War sort of engagement, the tank was the, the punch. It was, it was leading the fight, and it was the combat arm of decision. Well, in, in an insurgency uh, where you don't know where the enemy is or who the enemy is, and, and you're in an urban scenario, the tank becomes a hunter and the Bradley becomes a killer. So uh, they complement each other very well. The integration of tank and troops has become a lethal combination of firepower and rapid deployment in the field. I wouldn't want to fire one. I wouldn't want to fire one at all. But it all looks fun because the engineering side of it and that. But when it comes down to having to sit in one in battle, and that, I certainly wouldn't want to do it. Anyway, it does. I've got a big respect for the people who used to fought them. And that, they've done well, to be honest. More than six decades after this comet saw action in the battlefield, and 12 years of patiently collecting all its parts, this Comet tank has finally come together in one piece. But before it's ready for action, the engine has to be rebuilt, the electrics installed, and the detailing completed. I think it's probably gonna take us another two years. It's a labor of love that requires patient determination, but summer is fast approaching and it's time for the crew to prepare their first annual tank show. And this tank show promises to be a smash. After a long winter, summer finally comes to the Isle of Wight. For some, it's a chance to enjoy the warm weather. For Dave Arnold and his crew, this is the time to take some tanks for a spin. Dave's friend has lent them a fully restored Comet tank and they're going to run it at their first annual tank show. It's a perfect day. The visitors have gathered. They have 10 tanks and guests from the British Army and two cars that are about to make the ultimate sacrifice. Bob becomes the master of ceremonies. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We shall be commencing our display. At the moment, just driving around in the arena for you is our Saracen Armoured Personnel Carrier. We are offering rides in this vehicle this afternoon. Three pounds adult, two pounds children. Tickets available at the museum shop. Retired tank driver Ginge takes the visitors for joy rides. Dave and Dave handle the tanks. This vehicle's a Cold War warrior. Dave Barnes is the master of the Soviet T-54. I think it is. I think driving the T-54 is his favorite thing about working here. <laughs> he always drives it because no one else can be bothered with it. It's a horrible thing to drive, and he seems to have mastered it pretty well, so we let him drive it. Then the Comet takes center stage. Out of all of them, I think probably the Comet's the nicest to drive. It's much smoother, the gear changes, a crash box, but when you double the clutch and drive it properly, you get the gears nice, it's nice and comfortable to sit in. The suspension is superb, it just floats along. After 
After the tanks have done their rounds, it's time for car crushing. The lamb to the slaughter. Anybody want any spare bits? Now's the time to ask. Blow by blow of the T-54 versus car. Well, the cars always lose. <laughs> we use the T-54 for crushing the cars because the T-54's got the strongest track guards that can put up with all the abuse of having the bits of mangled car go around them. We take off the bits of track guards that uh, will get damaged. And then David takes over and he always does the car crushing at the end. He likes to take one slice at a time across the car just to tease the crowd. I think, really, you can just tell by the look on his face how much he's enjoying it. He loves every minute. In fact, he wouldn't actually let anybody else in the tank to do it, so... If you said to him, can we crush a car? No, nope, you wouldn't get in there. May 8th, 1945. 47 days after the Comets first crossed the Rhine, the Allies took Berlin and the war was over. The Soviet Army organized a massive victory parade through the streets of Berlin. It was an opportunity for each Ally to show off their latest tank. For the British, it was the Comet. The Americans, the new Pershing. But the Soviets had prepared a surprise. And the Russians, being, as you know, brilliant show people, saved their contribution until last. And it is said that at the end of the Russian parade, the Inter den Linden began to shake. And what they saw for the very first time was the Stalin tank, the IS or JS-3, the latest Russian heavy tank. No one in the West had seen it before. 122 millimeter gun, huge wide tracks clattering along three abreast. The massive Soviet tanks dwarfed everything in the Allied arsenal. Now, it is said that the British officer on the saluting dais was seen to turn pale and his jaw dropped. And Patton, who was standing alongside him, is reputed to have said out of the corner of his mouth, don't worry, buddy, we're still on your side. The Comet tank, in its hour of victory, was already obsolete. The Second World War was over, but the Cold War was about to begin, and with it, a new era of the super tank. So I think sort of it did what old soldiers do. The Comet just slowly faded away. And then in the early 1960s, they were put out onto the British Army ranges for target practice. After decades of neglect, the crew at the Isle of Wight is determined to keep alive the memory of what was once Britain's finest tank. The goal is to have four. It'd be the only troop of running Second World War tanks in the world. Not just one Comet, but a platoon of four all in running condition. All it takes is perseverance and time. Well, we've done a lot in 12 years, haven't we? We've moved workshops, completely built a museum. You know, and there's only like a couple of you doing it. it takes 12 years. <laughs> It is what I want to do for the rest of my life, to be perfectly honest. This workshop is going to be busy for years to come. Some wedgies, crowbar, oh, 50. Uh, 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 Big hammer. Hmm? Here we go again. 